Hello, uh, good morning and welcome to the Oxford Maths Online Open Days. Um, my name's James, I'm the Admissions Coordinator for Maths at Oxford and on behalf of everyone in Oxford, welcome to the Open Day. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun, uh, we're going to do a lot of different bits of mathematics. We've been preparing lots of videos for you and things to do during today um, and I'm going to use some of this time at the start here to explain what the structure of the day is and also to show you a little bit of mathematics. Um, it's just turned 10 o'clock so I'm going to give it uh, a little minute or two just for people who are joining us just at 10 o'clock. Hi if you've just joined us in the last 20 seconds. Welcome to the online open days at the University of Oxford Maths Department. Um, we're going to be doing some maths in a minute. Uh, let's just have, let's just check everything's switched on and in the right order and things like that. Right, okay. So I should say that throughout this um, first bit, uh, while, while we're live, 10 o'clock, um, we're going to have uh, some Q&A running in the background as well. So if you've got a question that you'd like to ask to one of our current students or to one of our tutors, um, they're currently in the Q&A. So if you are on the Open Days website and you click any of the Join Q&A buttons, um, then you can hop over there to uh, see uh, talk to them uh, and ask them what it's like being a student, what it's like being a tutor, or ask them about maths at Oxford or any of your admissions questions. I can see things coming in at the moment already. So hi to Lucinda who's just asked, what does a typical timetable look like for a math student at Oxford? I can't wait to see what our students say about that. Okay, great. So that's, that's running in the background. At some point, I'm going to put it on screen as well and discuss some of the Q&A, but I wanted to spend a moment at the start um, welcoming you today and explaining how to get the most out of it. Um, okay, let me just check my channels. That's happening, that's happening, that's happening. Okay, great, right, okay. Um, I thought I'd start by showing you a little bit of mathematics, um, if that's all right. Um, I've been thinking a little bit about distance recently. Um, you see, uh, I'm doing this open day at a great distance from you, uh, and that's distance defined in the kind of sensible Euclidean sense. Um, Euclidean distance is this thing that you've been taught at school where you work out the uh, the length in terms of Pythagoras' theorem. It's all x squared plus y squared and take the square root and things like that. Um, there's a second year uh, university course in the Oxford Maths degree uh, that deals with metric spaces, uh, which deals with a more general definition of what distance might mean in a more dis in a more um, general space. Um, so we might be dealing with uh, maybe we're dealing with the x y plane, um, and maybe we've got the the sort of normal Euclidean distance. I'm going to spell Euclidean wrong, aren't I? Uh, Euclidean distance um, of between points in that space. But we might be interested in more exotic and different definitions of distance between points. Um, in second year. We teach this course in quite a general way um, so that uh, later on our students can apply what they've learned about metric spaces to complicated and different examples, maybe with uh, more alien or complicated topologies or, or uh, distance functions. Okay, but today let's talk about uh, the xy plane uh, with distance defined in the Euclidean sense, that's using Pythagoras. Um, uh, let's think about that. Um, there's a definition from that course that I'd like to show you. Um, it's called an open subset. So an open subset uh, is one, so it's a subset of your space, um, it's a subset for every point, every point in that subset has to be surrounded by a little neighbourhood that's in, that's also in the subset. Okay. Um, so that's the definition of an open subset. Um, so if I have this bit of uh, xy plane, then uh, not including the edges, then maybe that's open because uh, every point inside has got a little neighbourhood around it that's inside the set. So not including the edges. Um, I should not put the edges in if I want this to be an open subset. The edges are a bit of a problem because on the edge there's a, a bit that's not inside. Okay, um, some might be an open subset. The, the course has also got a definition of a closed subset. So a closed subset is one where the complement, so take everything that's not in, in your subset, look at the opposite of it. Uh, if that complement is an open subset, um, 
and then your subset is cl called closed. Um, okay, so that's not quite the opposite in the sense of it's not quite true that if you're open you can't be closed and if you're closed you can't be open. Um, in um, Euclidean, in the xy plane, uh, you can have sets that are closed and open. Um, so to be closed and open, a set would need to be open and its complement would need to be open. Um, but it's a surprising fact that we can prove that in fact the only set that's closed and open, there are two, the only subsets are the empty set or everything. Um, and that's because the xy plane is path connected, is something we say. You can prove that the only sets that are open and closed are the empty set uh, or everything. Why am I telling you this? Well, our building is currently closed. Um, but somehow, even though our building's closed, we're still doing an open day. So we're in this sense uh, doing something that's open and closed at the same time. It's a dichotomy I've been thinking about. Um, and I suppose this shows that if you're going to be open and closed, then it's all or nothing. Um, we've got to give you everything or, or nothing. Um, okay, right. Just to be clear, in case anybody thinks that was all entirely a joke, um, everything above the line is actual mathematics from second year. Everything below the line is a joke. And we are online. Right, okay, um, quite enough of that. Right, okay, um, let's talk about how you can make the most out of today. Um, so we're gonna throw a lot of mathematics at you. Um, I hope that's okay. We've been busy making bits of mathematics and uh, recording them and putting them together. But we're also doing some live stuff. Um, so we're currently live with a Q&A. Let's just check in on the Q&A. How's this going? Um, ah, we've got a question about supercurricular reading um, and a question about maths and statistics, which I'm hoping people can answer over over there as well um, so that's that's currently running people are currently talking to um, somewhere between six and ten of our current students depending on how many of them are awake at the moment <laughs> it's 10 a.m. on a Saturday uh, and a couple of tutors as well I've got photos of uh, Richard L and Vicky Neal on screen as well I think they're currently in chat answering questions okay just checking Vicky's called me over what's going on there are more questions, but they're being archived. Ah, so some of the questions might be archived. We might try and keep some of the questions visible so that you can see what other people are asking. Keep them keep them going like that. Okay, I might, might pop into the Q&A in a moment to see how that's going. Um, okay, um, Ask a Student's gonna carry on until 12 o'clock. We're gonna keep the students around uh, until midday. If you want to talk to them, ask them questions. Um, please make the most of that. Chat to them about what it's like. They're all very friendly people. Um, uh, our tutors are going to be here till 11 um, while I'm live and then we're going to get people back again at 4pm for a kind of wrap up at the end of the day. Um, so we're going to do some more Q&A at the end of the day if stuff has come up during the day and you would like to ask questions at the end of the day and talk about next steps, what to do uh, after the open day to make the most of learning mathematics. Okay, um, it's quite a long way until 4pm isn't it? Um, so here's some suggestions of what you could do during the day. Um, I'm running a couple of maths workshops uh, later on today. Uh, so if you're interested in thinking about maths questions, then there's a, a video about uh, maths advice that I've recorded that you could watch, but also running some live mat workshops to talk about math questions. Um, we're running that twice at 1 p.m. and at 2.30 um, so that you can choose a time that's convenient for you if you need to work around your lunch plans or if you're sharing a computer with somebody else and they need a turn watching videos. Um, there's two match workshops. Um, ideally we'd have a kind of even number of people at each. There's no sign-ups, there's no registrations. I'm relying on a sort of game theory here. Um, you probably want to be at a workshop with fewer people because it's, so it's got a ni nice cl cozy classroom feel. Um, the only way you can do that is to sort of predict which one is going to have fewer people and then maybe that makes it even out in some sort of game theory sense. Okay, so we're running a, a mat workshop later. It would be great to see you there if you want to see some live mat questions and think about mat questions with me. Um, so that's one thing you can get up to later today. Um, in between, um, we'll be monitoring the Q&A if you want to pop in there and ask a question. Um, and remember we're live again at 4pm to sort of bring everyone back and do some, do some more questions. Um, in between, we've got a lot of pre-recorded videos. Uh, in a normal face-to-face -face open day, um, we'd have a timetable, we'd put you all in the biggest lecture room and we'd go through our timetable in order. Um, here, because things are pre-recorded, we've just put them all online and you're welcome to watch them in whatever order 
you want you want to whether you want to mix things around or skip things or go back and forth between things um we've got about five hours of content which is too much to watch all of it it's going to stay up um indefinitely if you want to watch back uh, not not just today um but if you watch this today you can ask us questions about it live um, so there's lots of content to choose between um, I really don't recommend that anybody watches all of it, to be honest. I mean, you could watch all of it if you wanted to, I suppose. Here's an overview of what we've got as pre-recorded content. Um, we've got some videos that are sort of uh, introductory. We've got Maths at Oxford. Uh, is an introduction to the maths courses at Oxford with Richard L, Director of Undergraduate Studies, looking at um, how teaching and learning works at Oxford and what courses we have. Um, we've got a quick video of the Andrew Wiles building, um, which I've also been putting on my slides because it's a lovely lovely building. Um, there's a video about math and philosophy for people interested in that joint honours course and information about computer science too in, in uh, video form. As well as those videos we've got more videos on specific maths topics. Um, so these are uh, videos made by our tutors or lecturers or uh, Oxford staff talking about maths that they're interested in. Uh, pure maths and applied maths on the left there uh, are an overview of uh, some of the maths topics in the maths degree at Oxford uh, and then differential equations, machine learning, convergence and infinity machines are particular uh, focused, focused uh, mini lectures on uh, a bit of content. In fact convergence is one of our first year lectures. Um, for the last year we've been doing lectures uh, online pre-recorded um, for our students um, and Convergence is an actual first year lecture that we've put up on YouTube if you want a sense of what our lectures have looked like in lockdown. Of course, you're applying, if you're applying for Oxford, you're applying for to start the course in 2022 or 2023, so by which point we really hope we're back to lecturing in the Andrew Wiles building, because it's lovely. But if you want to see an actual actual first year lecture, uh, Convergence of a series there as well, and everything else too. Right, okay, uh, as well as that, we've got even more videos. Um, so we have some uh, applications and uh, admissions advice. Um, some of these with me, some of these with uh, computer science department, um, looking at uh, an overview of how to apply particular parts of the application process. Um, very quick video about personal statements, advice about the mat, um, interviews. Uh, there's a mock interview uh, with a computer science uh, tutor asking a question to a computer scientist, but I sort of feel like it's a question that mathematicians should be able to say something about as well. So it's a mock interview if you want to watch that. Uh, day in the life video, um, recorded by a math and computer science student. Uh, and we've got information for teachers and parents and guardians. Lots and lots of pre-recorded video content for you to watch in some order. Um, so please feel free to dip in and out of that, uh, drop in and out of the open day, watch videos when you want to. Um, I've put on the open day websites, these are all in a big, big list if you scroll down um, I've tried to put um, in brackets how long the video is if you're trying to plan your day or trying to work out have you got time to fit in another quick video before lunch or something like that. It'd be lovely to hear, lovely to hear from you if you're uh, watching a video and you want to ask a question um, we're going to keep the Q&A box open all day if you want to uh, chat to us about something you've seen or if something doesn't make sense uh, or if you want to ask a follow-up question or if you just want to talk about what you've seen uh, in any of the any of the videos we've made or indeed any of the live sessions right okay i'm rambling slightly uh we've got more resources we've got more more links and things uh, if you don't want to watch videos we've got uh, other things that you might be interested in uh there's a big button linking to our mathematics prospectus with information about all the mathematics courses um, current list of course titles, um, some maths puzzles at the end if you would like to do some maths puzzles uh, instead of being told about personal statements or something. Um, and it's also got a list of recommended reading. Um, it's got some suggestions for books that we like. It's not a comprehensive list and we don't require anyone, any, we don't require anyone to read the books in, in the prospectus. I think I've read about two of the books in the prospectus. Um, but there's a, a list of books if you're looking for that over in the prospectus. Um, if you'd like to explore Oxford virtually, you see normally when you come to an open day we'd arrange for you to have a chance to look around a college. Um, we can't do that today, um, but we have made um, some maps of Oxford. Um, we have a 2D option and a 3D option. Um, on the left here uh, there's a button for a uh, uh, Google Maps uh, view of Oxford with links to virtual tours of all the colleges that offer maths. Um, so on a normal open day you would look around one college, here you get to look around all of the colleges if you want to see um, inside the colleges uh, on a map there with some information about the colleges. Um, we've also 
built that in, uh, we've also put the links into Google Earth as well. Um, we're not sure if this is going to work for everyone all at once. Um, I suppose you're welcome to, if it, if it goes down, you're welcome to open Google Earth yourself and sort of fly over Oxford. There's lots of nice 3D modeling that's happened for Oxford over there as well. Uh, and there are links to the virtual tours of colleges over there as well. Um, okay. Um, what else have we got? Um, oh, here's a button for the Oxford Online Maths Club on the uh, on the Open Days page. If you're looking for supercurricular mathematics, uh, we run a weekly maths live stream uh, with suggestions for maths to maths that you might be interested in. Um, it's got follow-up reading, it's got bits of live mini lecture and puzzles and problems and things like that. Um, you'll notice that I mentioned the Oxford Online Maths Club quite frequently in my pre-recorded videos. I'm it's shameless self-promotion. I'm heavily involved in organising it and hosting it. Uh, I think it's really fun. Right, uh, and other things we've put on the Open Day page. If you want to dig a little bit deeper into the Oxford Maths course, um, we've put uh, links to uh, an archive of everything that we lectured for the undergraduate course in 2019-20, so last academic year. Um, that includes all of the course synopses, so details of what's in each course. Uh, if you've seen an interesting course title and you want to find out what we taught in that uh, uh, last year, um, you can also have a look at lecture notes if you want to, or problem sheets, or things like that. Um, please note that courses may change in the future. So this is an archive of last year's course, and we, we might change things going forward. Okay. Um, I'd like to, before I switch to a Q&A, I'd like to um, have a slide here about what Oxford's doing about coronavirus. Um, so we've been uh, under various forms of lockdown for just over a year now, and I think that the Oxford College system has really come to the fore. Um, we have, uh, Oxford also has these colleges that organise tutorials and pastoral support for our students, and that kind of community structure has been really helpful. I think the colleges have done a really good job of uh, adjusting to the individual needs of students and being really flexible. Um, having these tutorial supports means that we're uh, keeping an eye on how our students are doing with uh, the different style of uh, teaching that we're doing now that everything's online for the last year. Um, and we've been able to uh, keep in touch with our students uh, and I think uh, really well um, with the support from uh, colleges and the departments. So the department's been doing a lot of work to move things online, support students, make sure we're doing things in the way that's best for them. Um, as I mentioned, lectures and tutorials are online, and it would be remiss of me not to mention uh, the vaccine. Um, so I'm not taking any credit for Oxford's vaccine, but given my title of what's Oxford doing about the coronavirus, it feels like I should mention the uh, one of the world's first uh, coronavirus vaccines, um, which Oxford put a huge amount of brilliant work into. Okay, um, that's my sort of presentation. Um, I'd like to use uh, the rest of this time up to 11 o'clock if that works uh, for you um, answering your questions. I'm going to switch over to whatever's going on in the Slido uh, right now. Uh, we're going to see what's going on there um, and answer answer your questions. Um, let's see if I can set that up. Um, if you're staying with us until 11 o'clock, that's great. We've got some uh, students and tutors. The students are staying until uh, 12 o'clock as well, of course. Um, I think I'll turn off the live stream at about 11 o'clock. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, okay, let's see. So I need to switch this one to this. I need to switch this one over here. Uh, maybe that. And let's nudge this in a little bit. There we go. Okay. Um, so, right, okay. I've got this currently set to top questions. Let's find out what people have been talking about at the moment in the Q&A. Ah, right, okay, so Lucinda's asked about the uh, typical time timetable for math students. I hope a student has caught sight of that question and had to go at answering it. Um, uh, somebody's asked about maths and stats, or just math, so choice between the maths and maths and stats degrees. Um, so they have the same first year, let's do this out loud. I'm I'm sure there's an answer there already. Um, <laughs> they have the same first year. After that, the Maths and Stats course unlock more statistics options in later years. So there's a, uh, a wider range of statistics courses that you can do if you're doing Maths and Stats. You're allowed to have um, more than 25% of your degree at the end be made up of statistics modules. Um, so there's uh, a balance. Some of the statistics modules are compulsory core courses for people doing Maths and Statistics because you need them for later courses. Um, so it's slightly different. Um, 
somebody would like to reapply while they're enrolled at another university. Um, so this is technically something that you can do. You, we don't do transfer between universities. You'd be applying to start from the start. As a result, it's not quite something that I recommend because you'd be redoing years of university that you've already done elsewhere. Um, to, to reapply and start again um, is going to take extra take extra years that maybe wouldn't be the case if you stayed at the current university you're at. Um, in cases like this, I usually recommend that people look at uh, options like um, uh, graduate study at Oxford. So we run this uh, fourth year course. Um, our fourth year is called Part C, um, and we have um, a sort of parallel course um, called uh, Oxford Masters of Mathematical Sciences, OMS, um, where people come from other universities to study the fourth year alongside our Part C mathematicians, um, which is a really great course with lots and lots of options in, lots of directions to take that uh, fourth year course. Uh, the question is about the MAT, which is the Mathematics Admissions Test, um, which this year is on the 3rd of November 2021. Um, we don't charge a fee for the um, administration of the MAT. Um, your test centre um, which is normally taken in school or college. If you're taking it in a test centre, uh, then they might charge you a fee for invigilation, uh, which is outside of our control. Um, but there's no fee from Oxford for doing it. Uh, and it has, as a requirement, um, a very limited syllabus of maths that we expect you to see. Um, ben would like a breakdown of everything that happens in the interview. Um, so, sort of standard interview experience. I'm sure these questions have answers in the slider as well. For some reason, I don't have the answers on screen as well. Uh, but you know, I'll do an out loud answer, and I hope it agrees with what people have typed in the uh, people have typed in the slider as well. Okay. Uh, what's going on here? I've been distracted mildly. Uh, yes, okay. Um, so everything that happens in an interview. Right, okay. Um, uh, so normally interviews happen in person. We've last year been doing interviews online. This year we, we don't know at the moment whether we're doing our interviews online or whether we're doing them in person. So um, uh, either way, we're going to ask you mathematics questions. We're going to ask you questions relevant to the degree you've applied for in general. Um, so you might arrive um, at the start of an interview. I've sometimes asked people um, uh, the following bit of small talk, which is uh, how was your journey? To, how was your journey getting up to Oxford? That doesn't work when we're online. Um, and also, I think people started to interpret it after a while as the sort of root finding maths question, which didn't have the effect I wanted. I've, I've since found that the right way to get maths applicants to calm down is uh, to ask them maths questions straight away. It also helps me to calm down to talk about maths. Um, so if you have an interview with me, then I'll say something like hello, I'll check that I've got the right person in the right place, and then I'll ask a maths question uh, and start talking about mathematics. Um, that might involve me uh, telling you a new bit of mathematics or reminding you of a thing from A-level maths or equivalent, um, and then asking you to join in or asking you a question. Um, that question might be really difficult. It's possibly not the sort of question you can do straight away. Um, so it's okay for you to ask for help to say, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, but here's an idea um, and start that conversation. Um, usually I would start by having a sort of warm up part of the question to uh, get everyone comfortable and make sure we understand the, the setup of what I've got in my question. Um, and then we'd go through it. Um, so you would tell me how you're going to do the part of my maths question. Um, and I'd say something like, great, let, let's go and write down some maths. Um, that's sort of interactive in the sense that uh, the interviewers are there to help you out as well. Um, they're there to help steer you if things are not going very well and they have a suggestion to steer things on track. Um, the interviewers know how to do the question and they might try and give you a hint or ask a, a slightly different modified question. Um, so it's not uncommon for an interviewer to ask a tricky question, you say something that has sort of an idea in it and then the interviewer asks a sort of different question to try and help you make the next step to understand a kind of wider context. This is quite hard being vague on what my question is, but I'm still going. Um, towards the end, uh, we'll get towards some sort of solution. We might make the question harder. We might ask a sort of follow-up step of the question to uh, check sometimes if you understood what we've been doing all the way through. Um, we like to give you hints, but we like to also see that you've taken the hints on board and understood um, what we were doing with the question. Um, after that, I uh, might ask a second unrelated maths question. Uh, we might, so we might take it in terms of, for 
if you've got two interviewers, they might take in turns to ask questions. Um, and that's about it. Um, there's usually a chance for you to ask us any questions at the end of an interview if you want to, um, but you don't have to. Um, that's how I normally phrase it. Um, and you, yeah. Uh, so maths questions. I could have just said maths questions, Ben, um, but there you go. <laughs> maths questions with more steps. So we're not looking for people who are sort of, uh, we're not, okay, we're not looking for people necessarily to just do things straight away. Um, the questions are supposed to be hard and we're there to help. We, we're going to ask difficult questions because we know we can help you out with, with those. Okay. Um, average GCSE grades. Um, so we don't have any minimum number of GCSE grades in case that's what the question secretly is. Um, we know that GCSEs were taken um, a few years before you applied. Um, and they're in a range of subjects, not just maths. Um, and that makes them less predictive of how well you would do on a maths course than other things that are more recent and relevant. Things like uh, the mathematics admissions test and um, performance at A-level are sort of more interesting to us than your GCSEs. I think that makes sense, right? Um, of course, it's true that our applicants tend to have quite good GCSEs um, in the sense that they tend to be sort of strong academically. Um, we know that GCSEs are sort of one measure of academic potential in a in a vague sense, um, so that's uh, that's one way we we look at GCSEs as sort of a, a vague measure of academic potential. But we're also interested in maths. Um, uh, somebody called CS asks, can you visit any of the colleges at the moment? Um, so not at the moment; they're not currently open uh, due to coronavirus. Um, do I think there are going to be any in-person open day opportunities? So um, I personally think that that's unlikely at the moment um i think we'll get to uh, we'll get through the summer and just not have any opportunities like that the currently the uh, main university open days at the end of june start of july are also online only um, and that would have been a, a major opportunity uh, to visit colleges now we're doing, still doing everything online with all the colleges uh, uh, and all of the courses at oxford um, in an online virtual sense um, so i think it's possible that we're doing online only things again. Um, the sort of mild problem that if we do an in-person experience uh, just before applications then uh, it's quite stressful for everyone, uh, everyone who feels that they, they have to attend an in-person thing if we, if we just do one um, and we don't want to create that sort of stress. Um, okay, uh, how are we doing? We're doing top questions. I might switch to recent questions in a moment. Uh, is it harder for people to reapply during a gap year? So if you're taking a gap year, um, then my advice is that you should keep doing some mathematics. Keep looking at bits of mathematics um, uh, and try and keep your skills skills sharp. Um, I think we recommend that people look at something like a structured gap year program or some sort of teaching or tutoring um, or something like that to uh, keep, keep doing some mathematics. Um, is it harder? Well, we expect them to be better at maths because they're a year older, they're more experienced, they've finished qualifications that our other applicants haven't finished. So we expect more mathematical maturity, which I think means that we've, we would expect them to do slightly better on things like maths and maybe be slightly faster at answering things at interview, just because you've got more mathematical experience, um, you've finished qualifications and uh, uh, got the experience of Having seen a bit more mathematics, spent more time thinking about mathematics. Um, okay, um, how do I how do I want to do this? So I'm going down. I'm now at things with one thumbs up. A thumbs up. For, I didn't mention the thumbs up process in the Q and A. Um, so supercurricular reading I mentioned is there's a list in the prospectus if you're interested. Um, and I hope the moderators have put things in there as well. One thing you should know about maths and stats is that it involves options like machine learning and uh, fun modern statistics. Um, I think when I was applying to university, I hadn't quite made the connection in my head that statistics could mean more than A-level statistics. Um, it could be, uh, uh, there's a wide variety of how you make decisions and how you uh, teach machines to make the right decisions as well. Oh, Grant Sanderson's here, that's nice. Hi, Grant Sanderson. Um, <laughs> You can put your name as anything in the chat, um, uh, whether or not you are Grant Sanderson. Let's have a quick look at recent, see what's going on. Um, and I'm going to go back to the top, uh, right up to very recent. 
Um, ah, so Naomi's taking a mix of A levels and pre use. I, I'm going to type a response to this as well, um, but we we do off make offers on a mix um, between the two. That's that's fine. That's that's uh, fine with us. Um, uh, how often? So here's a here's a question. How often do maths undergraduates reach their level during their degree and find it difficult to continue? What support do you offer? Or do you find your application process is good at filtering out people who might not succeed? Ooh. Okay. Um. So the student ambassadors in uh, in chat have got uh, something to say about this, and I don't want to pre-guess what they're going to say. I'm, I'm going to talk about my own experience. I know that's super annoying for the ambassadors because I've got them in to be the students, and now I'm going to talk as if I'm a student. Um. I did find at some points during a maths degree that um, it was really tricky. Uh, everything was really hard. I was being asked lots of questions that I didn't know the answer to, um, and I was stuck. Um, and the way I got through that, the way I made progress, was by realising that I actually do like mathematics, not just because I find mathematics um, uh, easier than my other subjects at A-level. I find it like I can do mathematics questions. Not just that, but I also like mathematics. I also like being stuck on problems. I'm willing to put in time to get unstuck on things. If there's some uh, gnarly bit of theory that is very new to me and very unfamiliar, then I found that I could put the time in to to study uh, and learn that. Um, I think for some of our students that, that might be a new experience in, in some sense that um, being stuck on mathematics or finding mathematics difficult to learn uh, because of some new and unfamiliar mathematics, um, I think happens to all of us. Um, at some point we come up against mathematics that doesn't make intuitive sense straight away and you have to actually uh, reread it and learn it and get some experience with it, try some problems, try some uh, examples, work out uh, some consequences or why things are defined the way they are. Um, that's normal. Um, so we're definitely not we're definitely not filtering out people who find learning mathematics difficult because we all find learning mathematics difficult. Turns out it is tough. <laughs> um, uh, so the actual question is how often do people reach their level, which is a sort of tricky question. I wonder if the students have got a take on that. Uh, I will check back check back in the slide afterwards. Um, so support we offer is is uh, let's let's mention support because it's in there as well. Um, we let our, we we let our students think about the questions and get stuck on things, um, but we have fantastic support through our small group teaching in first and second year uh, tutorials, um, which are two or three students, one tutor who might be a member of teaching staff or a lecturer or faculty or a graduate student with training, um, to talk about uh, talk about the problems, uh, to um, talk to uh, the students about what they've been what they've been studying on a regular basis. Um, for each of the courses that they're doing. Um, so that might be a chance to catch up on something that they don't quite understand from the lecture notes. So my students might come to me and say, I don't really understand why we've done this bit in the lecture notes. What's this for? Or I can do it, but I don't really understand. Um, and then we can talk about that. And then we can do some, some of the problems. They've had a go at them. I've marked their work. Um, we can talk about that as well. Uh, the tutorial is a really good support for helping people. Um, we also have uh, quite good mental health support, I think, as well. Um, I think this is something that's been uh, improving across all universities recently. Um, in the last ten years, mental health support, I think, is really it's really great to see uh, universities doing uh, doing more on that. Uh, so we have support through our colleges and through a uh, central uh, support service as well. Um, everyone finds maths difficult. Um, yes, right. Okay, I like that question. Uh, good. Other than Matt and uh, Oxford interview, is there any other entry requirements for Indian students? Um, so we're going to ask you to do something equivalent to A-levels. Um, let's talk about international qualifications as well. Um, I made a video about A-level policy because that's what a lot of our applicants are doing. If you're doing A-levels, um, that's the same as lots of people. I don't know why I phrased that towards you. Um, if you're doing A-levels, you're doing A-levels. Um, but there are lots and lots of other international qualifications that we think are equivalent to A-levels. So for uh, students doing Indian qualifications, I think there's something called um, the uh, year 12 qualification where we would ask for particular grades in that qualification um, as, as a kind of alternative to A-levels. Um, in practice, this means that as well as doing the maths in the interview, um, you, need to, you need to stay in school or college, finish the qualifications that you're doing and get um, some particular grades that we've decided as being equivalent in some sense to our standard A-level offer. Okay, um, 
So what's learning support like for students with learning difficulties such as dyspraxia and dyslexia? Um, so I'm going to try not to generalise because we do individual student support um, uh, through the disability advisory service um, in uh, some cases where that's appropriate, um, working with students to identify their actual needs and what we can what we can do to help them. Um, so we, we do individual individual support. Um, Oxford is sort of not a huge not a huge university, which helps us sometimes. We have the, the colleges for support as well. Um, so we especially since I'm be, just been talking about admissions forefront of my mind is that. Um, we want to take things like this into consideration uh, during your application um, so that we can make any necessary uh, adjustments to things like the mat paper or at interview um, if there's something that we can do to help accommodate uh, disability there. Um, it's important we, we encourage you to disclose uh, things like this during the admissions process so that we can take them into consider consideration and help adapt things to be suitable for you. Um, so we don't really have a one size fits all. I, I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have an easy answer. Like we print everything on green paper or something because we know that it's very different from student to student. Okay, um, Johnny would like to know which is the best college for indoor sports like karate. I think karate might have a, a university society. So some of the societies and sports are organised by the colleges, um, which is nice because then we can play the colleges against each other in a sort of football league. Um, and some of the sports are organised. There's one big society for all of the colleges together. I can't remember if karate is like that or not. Um, I guess Johnny's asking about karate um, for a reason. Um, there's a big list of student societies on the Oxford website, um, which I might put a link to. Johnny, if you check back later, I might find a link to the karate society. Or I might Google Oxford University Karate Society to work out how that works. But it's possible. It's possible that there isn't a best college for karate at Oxford is, I suppose, the thing I'm going to hang for. Oh, loads of questions have come in while I was talking. Um, if I'm reapplying, do you recommend starting at another university for maths or doing a gap year and do maths for myself? Um, so if you've got an offer, so there's a context here, if this person's got an offer for another university, then I think I recommend that they study maths at that university. Um, maths degrees are much more similar than they are different um, across the UK. Um, they uh, all kind of all have uh, this aim of uh, catching people up with mathematics between about 1800 and the modern day um, and there's pretty clear string of prerequisites for how we might do that um, so if you've got an offer from maths not at Oxford maybe you were unsuccessful in an Oxford application um, then it might be the best case for you to study maths at that university you've got an offer for rather than doing a year out or doing an extra year of your life at another university and then starting Oxford afterwards um, I don't really have advice on whether you should spend that year at another university intending to, to switch or whether you should do a gap year, I kind of think there's this third option where you do a, do, a, do, a degree, do a degree at that university. And that's the fastest way to get a maths degree, which I think out of the options. Um, Phoebe, if you're applying for maths and philosophy, um, then you don't need to do any other tests other than the maths. Um, in particular, you don't need to do the TSA. That seems to be the one that people think they have to do, and they don't have to do it. So yeah, just the math, uh, just the maths test. Uh, we don't expect you to have previous experience um, studying philosophy. So we, we don't require philosophy A level or something like that. Um, so um, you, we <laughs> we need to be interested in philosophy, but we don't need you to um, have previous experience of philosophy. Okay. Uh, hmm. uh, is there any financial support for EU students or British citizens non-residents, so bursary scholarships, ETC? Um, it's a very small amount of financial support um, in this case. Um, it's something that I think the university is looking at post-Brexit. Um, uh, our financial support structures uh, might need to be different in this case. Um, at the moment, uh, if you use the scholarship search tool, I'll put a link on this comment after we're live. Um, there's a scholarship search tool where you can look for scholarships um, available to applicants from your country. Um, we have quite a lot of different scholarships. It's quite a confusing uh, mix of things, but there's a search tool for you to find out if there's uh, scholarships available for your situation. Um, EU students slash British, British citizens, non-resident. I don't have a memorised scholarship, I'm afraid. Um, there's a search tool. 
Um, and there, there's some scholarship support available, but not a lot, I'll say now. Um, hi there, anonymous user who's an international GCSE student currently doing iGCSE additional maths. Um, is that equivalent to GCSE further maths qualification? <laughs> this is the sort of question I love. Um, okay, um, so iGCSEs we treat as equivalent to GCSEs. Let's work it out. Additional mathematics 06, 06. Um, it's an iGCSE. We're going to count it as a count it as equivalent to a GCSE grade, and that's pretty much how we look at things. Um, we, in terms of your GCSEs, um, we look at a, a measure of how great your GCSEs are, how great your GCSEs are taken as an aggregate. Um, we don't single out particular subjects within your GCSEs for that measure. Um, we sort of uh, look at your GCSEs altogether, or iGCSEs altogether. And that's just one. That's just one sort of small measure that we use as a indicator of potential academic um, success. Which I justified before by saying that okay, um, GCSEs you take them a long time. You've taken them a long time ago, and they're not all in mathematics. But on the other hand, um, they sort of have some information in about um, how you might uh, how you might approach doing lots of exams. Um, we look at them in the context of the school or college where you did your GCSEs. I guess school where you did your GCSEs, um, so that we're aware that GCSE profiles are different at different schools, and some of that is due to school, which we're going to try and allow for. Um, our interviews can be online this year. Uh, we currently aren't ready to announce whether interviews are online this year or not. Either way, uh, they're going to be mathematical in nature. Um, so last year we did all of our interviews online uh, with people joining uh, video calls to talk to us about mathematics and that went uh, quite well I think uh, we uh, managed to do mathematics with people over over the internet um, I sound really old when I say over the internet um, we managed to uh, do things like that uh, talking talking to people about mathematics and even getting them to join in with some mathematics through online whiteboards um, so that's an option that we've got depending on uh, progress of coronavirus uh, over over this over this um, the next six months or however long it is. Um, okay, um, so we don't know yet. Um, it's a it's a possibility. Um, it shouldn't affect how you prepare for applications, if that makes sense. Um, that it, it it it's not going to affect what the interview actually is or or how we use interviews, whether they're online or not. Uh, they're still going to be test of doing some mathematics either way. Um, we'll be in contact, of course, with all of the people we shortlist for interview to let them know whether interviews are in Oxford or online. Um, obviously, once we've shortlisted closer to the day. Um, and if we have an announcement before then, then it will be on places like the Oxford website or uh, the information out there of what we intend to do. But it, it shouldn't affect your, your preparation, the way you think about uh, the interview and getting ready for things. Um, ah, so here's a question about midterm grades, which I think is an American thing. Let's put my American uh, American hat on. Um, if the midterm grades are not up to the mark, can we just report the final term grades? So this is actually a question about UCAS, about how how UCAS asks you to declare results. Um, uh, so the UCAS rule is you need to declare any qualification you've previously complete com completed and. Uh, declare any qualifications out upcoming. I can't remember whether midterms count as a qualification or not. Um, so I think that's I think that's the question. If your midterms are a formal qualification, then you need to report them on the UCAS on the UCAS form by the UCAS rules. And if they're not, then you don't need to report them. Don't need to re report them. Um, slightly worrying that they're not up to the mark, which I think at some point at some point. <laughs> What do I what do I want to say? Um, if they're not up to the mark for some reason, if there's some extenuating circumstance or mitigating condition that we should know about, then you should probably tell us about that so that we can take things into context. Um, yeah, there's a sort of uh, there's sort of something I'm slightly uncomfortable about about the not reporting things because they're not up to the mark. Like we're going to do other maths tests, like the maths submissions test, and we're going to ask you maths questions at the interview. Um, so at some point, uh, we'll find out if you're up to the mark. Okay. How many assessments are there during the maths course? Students want to talk about their exams, um, so we do um, exams at the end of each year, um, and the exams at the end of uh, second and third second and third year count towards the uh, final degree grade. So there are exams at the end of first year that don't count towards the degree. Um, I guess an important point here is that we're doing a lot of um, tutorials, a lot of small group 
tutorials um, teaching, small group teaching, um, where students are handing in work and the tutors are marking it. Um, but that doesn't count towards their final grade. Um, so Oxford still um, has it, it, most of the assessment through exams at the end of the year, rather than building up credit throughout the year. Um, I'm saying mostly exams because there are some elements of coursework, uh, a, a small amount of coursework. Um, there is a computer computer assisted project in uh, some of the years, first year, and I think options in second year. Um, and there's a chance to write an essay later on to replace uh, replace a, an exam with some sort of essay or structured project later on in the degree. Um, okay, ah, right, okay. There's a very, very admission specific question at the top here. If any of the ambassadors are watching, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm answering every question that's coming in, but you know, I've got, turns out I can, I can, turns out I can handle that. So I'm answering every question. You're welcome to also answer questions in text on the, on the Slido. Okay, uh, if I missed anything important along the way while I was, if I missed anything, let's have a quick look at popular again. Ah, oh, Joseph, your question has got to the top on any books which are particularly helpful. Um, in the prospectus um, and the timetable question is in those still doing well thumbs ups as well brilliant stuff <laughs> okay <laughs> um, uh, okay what do I want to do next um, is it preferable to do well consistently in all admissions areas uh, predicted great interview mat etc or to do really well in certain areas and slightly worse in others so preferably I think uh, Preferably really well in all areas, right? But that's greedy of me. Um, let's go through the things in your bracket. So predicted grades. Um, so predicted grades we know aren't aren't perfect, um, but it's generally true that our applicants are predicted um, grades that meet our meet our standard conditional offer. So if you're doing A levels, um, almost all of our applicants are predicted grades that meet our standard conditional offer, which is A star in maths, A star in further maths, A in a third subject, out of the people doing further maths. Um, uh, so predicted grades doesn't help us distinguish between candidates very much. Um, we're sort of lucky in that we have lots of applicants who are all fantastic at mathematics, especially through the lens of predicted grades. Um, excuse me. Um, so doing well in the mat is important because the mat is one of the main things we use to shortlist um, so we to decide out of our thousands of applicants who are we, who are we going to shortlist for interview um, so it's then important that you do well in the mat so that you make it sort of to the next round in some sense uh, of admissions um, interview is then important because um, we're going to actually uh, ask you math questions face to face and see how you adapt to new ideas and information if we can give you hints what happens um, so sort of all the things in the bracket are important, sort of in different ways. Now, none of them is sort of a series of hurdles. We, we do look at things holistic. we, holistically. We look at everything together. Um, so it's okay, it's okay to, it's okay to have um, some things where you do well, but not really well. So that's my, my greedy answer of asking you to do really well in everything. Um, so, but I think our applicants do stand out in the sense that uh, they have good math scores, that's why we shortlisted them. They performed well at interview. Um, so uh, there's there's sort of people do stand out through both of those. I think I'm I think I've come back to asking you to do really well in all the things. Um, okay. Right. Um, is it realistic, Daniel? Uh, given I'd be 27 at the start of the course. Ah, oh, there's 10 people here. Hello. Um, also, will it be harder? Okay. So. You're 27. Um, I guess that means you've been out of formal education. I don't want to make too many assumptions, right? You, I'm guessing that means you've been out of formal education recently. Oxford's policy for mature students is we're going to look at recent um, evidence of academic performance. So we're going to look at things you've done recently. Um, so if 10 years ago or something you had A-levels that work didn't meet the grades, sort of doesn't matter at this point. We're going to look at things you've done recently, uh, ways that you might have prepared for the maths course. Um, in particular, if you've done anything um, equivalent in some sense to uh, A-level style preparation for a maths degree recently, then that'd be really interesting to us. Um, would it be harder in any way? Um, so I think that preparation probably is tough um, if you're studying independently um, or if you're studying um, getting ready for university uh, uh, later on. Um, 
it's not something I've done myself, but I imagine that that's that's a a, a tough thing to get get up to the kind of mathematical um, uh, fluency again that perhaps you had when you were seventeen. Again. Um, so you, your personal statement and your um, UCAS reference. We don't use recommendation letters. We have one one UCAS reference. We'll focus, I think, on talking about. Um, uh, recent recent things you've done that demonstrate that you would be a good student. Um, so you're thinking about doing a, a re internship at AI Research Institute. Does that count? Sounds great. Sounds like uh, you might get a chance to do some mathematics. Who knows? Um, okay. Um, so in terms of what we're looking at, we're looking for the same things we look at with the rest of our applicants. We're look, looking for people to be um, good at doing mathematics problems, good at applying what they know in different situations, and good at getting unstuck on problems. Um, most of our applicants demonstrate a kind of recent track record because they're coming straight out of school or college and they've got this recent track record of things like A-levels recently. Um, for mature applicants, we're looking at uh, the last three years and saying, um, what's, what's, what have you done recently as a way of preparing for this? Um, okay, that's a attractive 12 thumbs ups, which I think makes it the most popular question today. Um, you shouldn't be at a disadvantage when it comes to actually what we're, what we're looking for in, in admissions. Um, it should be the case that you too can make a competitive application. Um, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you said that you couldn't. Anyway, right. Um, can I recommend books or YouTube channels? Uh, so books. There's a list of books in our um, departmental prospectus. Scroll down to that button for a list of books in the prospectus. Uh, in the prospectus, um, YouTube channels though quite a lot. Um, YouTube seems to be going through a sort of educational maths um, golden age renaissance, maybe. Um, I'm sure the, student, the current students can uh, list what's hot at the moment in the uh, in the comments in the comments below. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna endorse particular YouTube channels on this stream. I think, um, but I'll let the students pick out their favourites. Um, in terms of how you how you use books or YouTube channels, I'll make the point uh, out loud here that you can um, you can. Uh, you can follow up on things that you've read in books or seen on YouTube videos. Um, you can follow up on those in other ways to develop an interest in a particular topic. So maybe you see something in a YouTube video that doesn't make sense to you, but it seems cool. Um, you might go and look, look that up somewhere else, type it into Google or equivalent, um, and look for something like uh, Wikipedia or Wolfram Mathworld to try and find out something. Wikipedia and Wolfram Mathworld are encyclopedias. They're very comprehensive and hard to read, so maybe you get more confused, but you see some links to other things that sound related, including one that you've heard before that maybe sounds a bit like something from A-level, so you try and explore that and build it together into this kind of cohesive understanding of bits and pieces of uh, mathematics. That's a really good way, I think, uh, to use a book or a YouTube video as a starting point to look at something else. Okay, um, yes, link descriptions underneath in the slide. Right, okay. Um, it's work experience. You don't need any work experience to apply for maths at Oxford. Um, is it intrinsically more valuable than reading a book or attending a society or maybe it's the other way around? I don't mind um, if doing work experience in a mathematical field um, prepares you for our course, gives you experiences that make you think about mathematics and give you experience of solving problems, then that could be good. Um, I have to admit, when I saw mathematical field, I thought you meant the object a field, um, which has group-like group operations and addition and division and subtraction. Anyway, you probably didn't mean that. Um, is that. Is that more valuable than reading a book? I think it's up to you. Um, books, reading books and attending a society is probably more available to people than work experience in a mathematical field. Uh, which is why I sort of recommend reading books. Uh, you don't hear me recommending work experience very much because I don't really know what work experience in a mathematical field might mean. Um, uh, oh, uh, da, 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 think about math problems. Uh, sometimes this means, ah, this question is about competitions. So we, we know about competitions. There are things like UKMT and uh, British Maths Olympiad, other countries are available, um, International Maths Olympiad and stuff like that. Um, we don't use your scores in that as an admissions um, criteria. So we know that some of our applicants have done that, but we're not selecting based on who scored what in those tests. We've got our own maths test for that, and we've got our maths admissions test that we get everyone to take, which makes it more of a fair test because everyone's doing it. Um, so if you're, do if you're doing these competitions, then hey, that's a source of fun and interesting mathematics that you might have a go at. Um, and perhaps it's a starting point as well for thinking about uh, related problems, to think about other things coming up. Uh, and to explore a little bit around the problems. So if you do a competition, it could be the case that you 
do a competition question, um, you get stuck on it, and then after the test you think about it and you go and explore that math thing. Ah, afterwards I thought about it for a week, and then I found that it's actually interesting and not as bad as I thought. Cool, and somebody's set me up nicely to ask about uh, talk about Opportunity Oxford. Um, Opportunity Oxford is a bridging course over the summer that we run for some applicants. Um, so this is um, a bit of extra maths over the summer uh, in a sort of summer school format with some online material as well that we arrange for some of our students. Um, not everybody, not everybody needs it or would benefit from it, um, but for some of our students, uh, we we uh, say you can start the course. Please also do this bit of summer course on at the front as well. It's a lot of fun. It contains a lot of a lot of fun maths over the summer. Um, so recommended if your offer for some reason says opportunity Oxford uh, summer 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 program. Then I recommend that you hang on to that and do the summer school. Come and talk to us about mathematics and then start the course. Um, so it's aimed at uh, helping make sure that if we've got if we've got applicants who uh, we think they would do great on course, but we need to um, help them out a little bit by showing them extra bits of mathematics over the summer. Then we can we can do that through this thing called Opportunity Oxford. Um, loads more on the web about Opportunity Oxford. It's very exciting. Um, can I confirm math course at Oxford and Cambridge? Um, so I studied at Cambridge and I now work at Oxford. So yes, um, the math courses are very similar. Um, they have um, both got this aim of getting mathematicians up to date with modern mathematics. Um, so. Uh, both of them are trying to teach you modern mathematics from where you are now to where mathematicians are if you get to the end of sort of fourth year of graduate study um, looking at modern mathematics. Um, both of them start with some core courses that everybody does and then later branch into more and more options. So you've got choices between which courses you do. Um, Oxford on the, offers courses like maths and statistics, maths and philosophy, maths and computer science, so joint honours courses where you get to do a bit of both. Um, so that's an option at Oxford um, to combine maths with one of those three things that's not on offer at Cambridge. Um, but in terms of structure and content, the courses are very similar. Teaching style as well. Um, we both do small group teaching. Uh, right, okay. Um, do we take into account extracurricular UCAS points, such as music grades? This one's easy. Uh, no. Uh, because we don't use UCAS tariff points. Um, we don't add up your UCAS points. Sorry. I, I suppose the person asking this probably wants me to, so sorry, but no, we don't, don't add up your UCAS points. Um, and question about step has kind of got the same answer. Um, if I take step and step and then I apply, I guess they say reapply, but I think they mean apply the first time to Oxford. Um, this has also got an easy answer. We don't use step, um, so we don't we don't look at your step grades as an admissions criteria. Um, we know that people might do step, they might do well in it, might have fun doing the questions. Uh, some of the questions are really, really tricky in step two and three, um, but we're not using it as an admissions criteria. We've got our maths admissions test, MAT, instead. Uh, rough idea of how competitive the Reach Oxford Scholarship is. Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I think it is quite competitive uh, for the Reach Oxford Scholarship. I think there are not a huge number of not a huge number of them. Uh, I don't know the statistic off the top of my head. Uh, I'm going to wrap up in a minute and switch to switch to typing rather than talking. Uh, typing has the advantage that I can look up links and I can point you in the right direction for things uh, and our current students are going to hang around until 12 o'clock as well if you want to talk to them. I mean about personal statement you see we can talk to students about what they put in their personal statements and um, we're going to switch to doing that um, not live so that I can type. Um, and uh, so at this point, I think I'm going to wrap up the live stream element of this. If you're still with us, thanks for watching. Um, thanks for hanging out and asking questions. Um, we're going to keep keep going and come back for another another bit of live Q&A at the end of the day at four o'clock. Uh, and don't forget about those Matt workshops in between and all the other Matt videos. Okay, um, so I think I'm going to hang up the live stream now, thank you very much for watching, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the open day. Okay, um, I don't have a screen for this. Uh, there we go, we'll do this one. Um, yeah, no, I haven't prepared this at all. <laughs> How do I stop? Uh, people who watch the Oxford Online Maths Club will know that I also have trouble stopping that live stream as well. Okay, we're going to work out how to turn this off together, uh, and then I'm going to go and answer. Oh, I promise. 
promise is lovely. We don't use it as emissions criteria. Right, okay, enough from me. Um, it's going to say going live soon. I'm not going live soon, but you know what it means. Right, okay, bye.